I'm Kevin Reyes, and this is The Study of Light. Welcome to The Study of Light. Today I have with me one of my favorite people. He is here with me right now in person, in the physical. I've been spending the last few days with you and it's been awesome and I've gotten to know you a little bit. For those of you who haven't met you yet, introduce yourself, tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Brady and I am a DP, a director of photography. When I first heard of you, it was on YouTube. I just remember seeing the the talking head looked amazing. I, I told you this already, but the talking uh -huh. head looked amazing. So I knew whatever was about to come was going to be amazing. But tell us kind of where your niche is or, you know, where are you most, you know, present? Right now, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is in this YouTube world, in this YouTube educational sphere. A lot of it will reside in cinematography and lighting. It's not just YouTube that I do. Uh, mm -hmm. I love narrative work, short films, films, even like narrative commercial stuff. Mm -hmm. Adding a story to some simple product is a blast for me. When did you start? Like, what was the whole beginning of this all for you? 2017 is where I started with video. I, photography for me goes back as far as 2012, 2011. Video yeah. just scared the crap out of me. Really? It was so intimidating. It wasn't until I started doing maybe vlogs, honestly, mm -hmm. which are not anywhere to be found for a rightful reason. Um, <laughs> but it taught me the basics of like exposure triangle in a video world and how that kind of varies from photo. And then from there, I got on a couple doc projects, just PAing, uh, ACing, just smaller things. And that's where I started to learn lighting. How did you get on like those first jobs? And so job? one of my great friends, Andre, I don't know if you've heard of Yik Yak back in the days. So it was like the anonymous college university Twitter. And I was scrolling through in class and I saw like, I need a photographer today, right now, like mine just canceled. And I was like, it's on Yik Yak. What are the odds that this actually pulls through? So I was a photographer with him. And then from there, we just kept being friends, kept working together. And as I transitioned into video, yeah. he was like, hey, I've got this project. You want a PA? And at that point, I didn't even know what a C-stand was. I was like, sure, let's go. Really? I didn't know anything. But it was, yeah. I mean, getting onset experience however you can through whatever connections you can. It doesn't have to be a huge project. This was probably like a six-man crew, yeah. super small. Um, but it taught me a lot of just like the environmental stuff of how you work in it, like any, any type of film set. Let's fast forward maybe a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you started a couple PA jobs mm -hmm. and then that's, then you started YouTube, right? Or what was yeah, that transition there, like? I was doing a lot of video for a marketing company, photo video kind of hybrid work. And that was just very like day of last minute videography stuff. Yeah. So not a lot of planning going into these shoots. But ironically enough, that was around the time that COVID hit. So everything just took a whole 180. Yeah. Um, I had left that marketing job right at beginning of COVID and I was like, I'll figure it out. Yeah. I got a couple one man band projects for some local clients and YouTube didn't come about until probably August of 2020. Yeah. And I was like, well, I've got nothing going on. I want to make educational content for like what was once me, little 13 year olds like myself that are out there just craving learning like I was. Yeah. So I was like, why not? What was that first experience like? Do you remember your first video of you recording it? And yeah. was it comfortable? Did you feel natural at it? What was that, what was that experience oh like God. making those first YouTube videos? First one went smooth. And I think it was because like, this is new, this is exciting. Like I, I got this. Yeah. It came to the second one. It was a little bit different because I collaborated with somebody else on it. So I was working in a studio similar to this. We'll skip over that one. But my third one, I remember I was like, I hate this. It was hot. It was middle of summer. I had lights. I had like a softbox right here on my face and it's like blaring at me. I'm dying. I'm like ripping off my flannels. I'm like, this sucks. I hate this. I kept stuttering and it was miserable for like really those first five to 10 after that. Cause it's a huge, I mean, it's intimidating even when you're sitting alone and you've got a camera in your face, Yeah. you don't know who's going to see it. You don't know whatever. And it's, it's nerve wracking. I remember here, you know, hearing about Brady and I looked at your videos like this is awesome. And then you just kind of blew up. What was that whole experience like? <laughs> so it wasn't my goal at all, really, to gain any kind of traction on YouTube. If I had helped 10 people, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. But then I think the rate of which that it happened and just the circumstances that we were in, there wasn't a lot coming for me. Yeah. It just, it was like the right time, the right place kind of thing. And at, at one point, which I'm sure we'll get to with the growth trend, I, I was like, why not? Yeah. And it was great. It was really a win-win, but it wasn't my initial intention. I mean, I just wanted to help maybe 10 people. Right. Yeah. But in this time, I remember, I think I posted something on Reddit. And so I started, I, I would hit the YouTube studio thing and I saw it refresh like plus two subscribers. And then an hour later it was like plus two and I was like, whoa, something is happening. 
Um, and I think Reddit originally pushed the traction to that, but then from there it was like, I don't know how, because I would wake up and it'd be like a thousand new subscribers a day, and I'd check the trends from the day before, it was like a thousand, fifteen hundred, and I'm like, is this normal? I had like one, one YouTube friend, and I mess, I'd message him and be like, is this normal? Like, does this happen to everybody? Because I don't know, it wasn't my goal, I didn't look into it, right. I had no knowledge, I just thought it was normal. So it was really weird when all of this started to happen. It's almost like you weren't even trying to do all the strategic growth yeah. you know, that you got. It's almost came, it kind of came naturally almost. I mean, the curve looking at the analytics like, spiked. Yeah. And it was, I think one of my favorite stories was the cake story that I'd mentioned before. I, I celebrated and got like a 10,000 cake for 10,000 subscribers. I was so excited about it. I was like, this is huge, this is crazy. But that was right as that curve started happening. So by the time I hit 20,000, I still had like an edible portion left of this cake left because that happened so fast. And I was like, what do we do? Do we cross out the one? And put like, I was like, this is so weird. That growth was probably say October, 2020. Okay. Um, so coming into this whole holiday season, I was like, okay, I need to do stuff weekly. I got to ride this wave while it's still here. Got it. So it wasn't until probably December or so when I started to consider it to be employment, like my full-time thing. Yeah. Um, and granted, I didn't have much work coming to me at the time, so it was almost like it's right here in front of me, why do I not take it? Yeah. So it, it was definitely confusing because it's not like a typical nine to five job. It's a whole social media employment, if we want to call it that, is a very confusing thing. Yeah. And I'm still learning it a year and a half in. But I think I finally said, okay, yes, I'm doing this full-time in about January. And at this point, I think I just hit 50,000. But Jeez, man. yeah, so in four months, this first four months was like 300 subscribers to 50,000. Wow. And I was like, this is mind boggling. Today you have how many subscribers? I think 99 and some change, 99,000 and something. You're just about I'm to right hit. right here. What were some of the challenges um, going through this, this, you know, since 2012 being photo into video and now YouTube. It's one thing that I've learned and at first is really hard to understand that there's a ton of plateaus. It's, it's a ladder with a bunch of flat areas pretty much. Yeah. So there were high highs like that point that we just talked on, but then there's also just flat areas that feel like you're going down. And that's when I found, oh, it's like an opportunity to grow. But in the very beginning, I think it was 2015. So I'd been doing photo at this point for four years, mm -hmm. made some money, but then I realized that I didn't touch my camera in six months because every time I did, I hated it. And wow. I almost quit. I, I was gonna sell my camera right before going to college, but I got to college and my roommate was like, dude, you're kind of good, you should keep going on it. So that was like a, okay, and then I took that point in my freshman year of college to really educate myself again. So that was a really big one that I just had almost given up on. But then once you start to go from the hobby to career side of things, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. So confusing and there's definitely times when I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. This isn't yeah. for me. And I look up to many people in the industry and say like, they've got it going on. They know what to do. That's not for me. Yeah. I'm not nearly good enough. I just like cameras. Well, I feel like that happens to every, not only filmmaker or DP or YouTuber or whatever, but it happens in the creative world in general. There's these moments where it just, like you said, stagnant. Mm -hmm. You start questioning things. There's time to get in your head a mm -hmm. lot. You start doubting yourself. All right, I'm in this rut. I feel like I'm in um, a stagnant, kind of complacent moment. Maybe it lasts for two, six, a year long. What were some of the practical things you did to help mm -hmm. you push through those things? The hard part is going through the meat of it. Like you're gonna have to experience, experience it and you're gonna have to just go through it and be sad. Yeah. Cause then, then, then you learn afterwards. Now I know like, okay, this plateau means I'm gonna go through this for a little bit. I'll probably take a step back and just say, I'm not gonna work. I'm not gonna try to excel right now. Yeah. Um, that's why I like film photography. It's just, it separates me from work. I do it for fun. Yeah. It's just entertaining for me. So maybe I'll just shoot film. And this happened a few months back, probably in August, I went to Utah and I was like, I'm not gonna work. I'm just gonna shoot and enjoy this. Yeah. And I came back refreshed. So you kind of have to accept that you're gonna go through this time. Yeah. But once you start to ease out of it is when you have a whole new mind and a whole new vision on it. And that's when you grow a little bit. And then you're working your way up the ladder more. And then you look back a year in the past, two years, five years in the past, and you're like, wow, I remember that. Yeah. I remember that time I almost sold, almost sold my camera. Yeah. I hated it. And I'm proud of where I'm at now. I know I'm not at the top of the ladder. The sure. ladder's still, geez. 
yeah. way up there. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people have that and mm-hmm. deal with that and they don't know how to get through it. And depression and anxiety and stuff like that is a very real issue, mm-hmm. especially in the creative world. You got stuff like imposter syndrome and just not feeling good enough. And there's always going to be someone better than you. And so um, kind of like you said, accepting it, mm-hmm. knowing that it's normal mm-hmm. and you're supposed to kind of be in that place. It's normal for you to go through that. Um, and again, knowing that people like you, even with all the success that you've had, go, go, went through that as well. And still go through it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I felt that way two weeks ago. So Yeah. Well, I think that's super encouraging for not only me, but hopefully them as well. So now you're successful in YouTube. What's your kind of your, your goals in the next, let's say, five years? I would love to. I love YouTube. I love teaching. I'm not going to stop. Yeah. It's just, it's entertaining for me. But there's also other aspirations that are out there. Uh, definitely getting more into the industry than I already am. Just keep growing and doing larger projects. I love working with the crew and the, and the community feel of the industry is addicting. Yeah. Like everybody, that's one thing transitioning from photo to video mm-hmm. and film is that photo, everyone's kind of on their own and sticks to their own. Right. And film, everybody wants everybody to succeed and everybody needs everybody to create something. Yeah. Which is so intriguing and fascinating and that's what I like about it. So I want to just keep growing into that, meeting people, creating with people and working on projects because that's, that's where the fun is. What would you tell someone or even your younger self um, before you started all this, mm-hmm. like before you knew what was going to happen? The one biggest thing, especially with the insecurities that come with social media right now and oh. kind of how we mentioned on that, completely ignore it. It's such a, and everybody says it, but it's true because I, it's like my biggest enemy. So. Yeah ignore the fact that somebody's working on a project with Lamborghini or whatever. You don't know where they're at behind the screen of social media either. They could be dealing with the same thing looking at somebody else that they look up to and I know that for a fact because there's people that I significantly look up to that have said the same thing to me. Yeah. So completely ignore it. Um, and then also know that if you like this stuff, if you love creating, if you love being an artist in whatever way, you belong in the industry. Don't feel intimidated by reaching out to somebody or going out or making friends or talking to people or just sending a message. Because that, that's the biggest connection maker is just reaching out and putting yourself forward. And that stopped me so many times of just not wanting to because I'm young, I don't feel like I belong. Because I started at like 12, 13 years old. Yeah. So when there's like this little 16 year old boy with a Canon Rebel who's like, I got this. <laughs> and it's like, no you don't. But like, it was, uh, looking back at my work, I was like, yeah, I could have done it. Why am I, why did I stop myself? Right. So that, that's probably the two biggest one and a half pieces yeah. of advice that I've got. I think that's great. I think that's right on the head. Let's get into the fun stuff that actually people care about gear. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite single piece of gear right now? Single piece. Uh, and you can't do the component like, oh, but it comes with the V mount or it like the, you know, single piece of kit. Ah, uh, I want to say it's my point to shoot film camera. I thought you were going to say that. I love that thing. I love how much you love that thing. And I I love it because one, it takes me away from the business side of things. It completely clears my head. It can be fun, but it's still a killer camera. I've got a Yashica T2. Yeah. Um, And it's just fun. You can carry it around. It's a fashion statement. It's a conversation piece. It's addicting. Film is addicting for me because it not only one just like separates me, but it it can also help me improve. So now we're going to talk about this scene that Brady shot, which I am so stoked on because honestly, this thing looks killer. <laughs> when you step into any location, mm-hmm. how, what's your mindset? What's your approach? What are you looking for? What's your, your, your mental workflow? First, narrowing down like a general frame or a general area, mm-hmm. figuring out like this is how I can make layers because that's in cinematography, you want to make a lot of depth and layers and contrast. Mm-hmm. Where are the windows at? Do I have windows that I can punch a light through potentially or motivate like some sort of directional key light off of? And then once you know where the window's at, if you need them in the frame, where's the sun at? What time of day am I gonna be at? And then from there, you take a step back, set your frame and then really dial everything in. So this scene, it was an interior scene and then the time of day was night. So we had a night interior and with night becomes a lot of opportunities for color contrast. You've either got cool urban sources if you're in a city or you've got cool moonlight contrasting with a lot of like the warm household lamps that are inside. So immediately you've got a really great separation uh, across the color palette of 
options for uh, color contrast. So we've got a nighttime scene. Um, before we get into the specific lighting, for all the camera lovers out there, I, I haven't forgot about you. This is a study of light, but we don't discriminate. What camera were you on, lens, and why did you choose both of those? Yeah, so my camera was the Sony FX6, just because there's no other option in the world except for that now. I'm kidding, there's plenty of great options. And for the lens, that was actually your Leica R50. Let's jump into our lighting. Let's start with the exterior lights. Um, talk to me about the lights you have out there. What are they? What what modifiers? What color temperatures? Uh -huh. How are they? How are those being used? Yeah. So all of the lights, for this matter, we we were using daylight sources. So 5600 mm -hmm. Kelvin all throughout. So I'll just say that up front. And then to achieve different color temperatures, we use different strengths of either CTO or CTB gels. For those who don't know CTO real quick, CTO, CTB, you wanna hit them with the, with the ones and twos? Yeah, so CTO stands for color temperature orange. So pretty much it's an orange gel that you're gonna stick over your light source to bring it down certain strengths more towards that tungsten color temperature. So on the contrast to that, we've got CTB, color temperature blue, which is a cool gel that you're gonna put over your daylight fixture or any fixture that you have for that matter. Nice. And cool it down even more so. Talk to us about the lights on the outside and what they were achieving for you. So the f very first light, I knew I wanted to fill this open living room area with some sort of texture. So I used an Aperture 300D mm -hmm. and I had a Fresnel. I knew I wanted a beam coming through the window that was gonna spill throughout the wall, on the door, on the floor. I just put it through the blinds and I shaped it a little bit with some shears as well and that created a great amount of texture and contrast as it went through plants, as it hit the shelf, the bookshelf where the mm -hmm. record was on especially. When we were looking at the frame, we saw that back window and the shear was dark and I took a Aperture 600D and we had that with a spotlight mount. And instead of shining it at the shear, creating more hard light, and you'd be able to see that it would be sourcey there, we shined it straight off of the balcony or the porch mm -hmm. ceiling. And that was a white source, so it really, really was an ambient softbox coming back onto the shears. So yeah. it was a really even soft light across the entire shears. It's, it's just enough to show some level. We've got that cool tone that is outside, and inside we really associate a lot of warm you know, homey lights. Mm -hmm. So we have the frame kind of peppered with a little bit of practicals, in-frame practicals. We had that lamp sitting just frame left to me. We had mm -hmm. uh, the wall lamp as well, just to the right of the interior door. Mm -hmm. And we even put some Aperture MCs on a warm color temperature as well on that bookshelf, which gives us motivation for more key lighting inside. Yeah. So for this light, we used, yeah, we used an Aperture 600D. I think it had to have been on 0.5%. Yeah, <laughs> Super. those things blast. Yeah, they really do. So we used the 3 4 strength CTO gel in the softbox that we added onto the 600D. Mm -hmm. And with just the softbox, I still wanted to maintain this coolness and that cool lights that we had brought from the outside. Mm -hmm. And a softbox would have washed all that out. So I, we used an egg crate and put it on the front of the softbox just to isolate the light really coming on me there in the chair. Yep. Motivated by that practical that was uh, just frame left of me. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, which I think was one of the best calls that you made was bringing in those little MCs. Part of the blocking is that you go back there into that bookshelf and it was just falling into dark. You didn't really know what it was. You knew it was something yeah. was there. I thought that was brilliant because it creates this little silhouette that you can't really make out. You're not exposed, but you don't need to be exposed. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary, but you can tell that there's something there. And I love balance. And I think you, uh, with this first shot in that back room, I think that it's perfectly balanced with not only contrast, color contrast, but you get these little pools of these warm tungstens to complement that blue mm -hmm. coming in, as you already mentioned, and it's just perfectly balanced. Let's get to where it gets even better. You walk towards the table. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the lighting there. I wanted it to feel like there was nothing there. It was just very soft, ambient light, and it was just coming from the, the house. Upstage lighting was, I knew I wanted upstage lighting yep. because you want that roll off across the face and mm -hmm. shooting into the dark side. And that's gonna create a really pleasing roll off and a pleasing contrast across your talent's face. So what we did here was set up really this wrapping around cove of unbleached muslin, wrapping all the way around onto the table and flat down on the table as well. Our light source was an aperture 300D. And then to match up with the practical, we used that 3 4 strength CTO gel as well. That effectively made such a beautiful light quality. Okay, now let's look at this scene in all of its entirety.
That was freaking beautiful. Thank you. That was awesome. I'm so glad I got to help you on that. It was all me oh, thank pretty you. much, but. Yeah, no, it was all you. I have a confession. I didn't think you'd tell them this, but go ahead. I, I, <laughs> I didn't think, think I would either. I bet they didn't notice. Now they're gonna notice. So we were looking through, we were excited, we were like little boys on Christmas, and we looked at the footage afterwards, and we keep watching it through and watching it through, and we noticed this one so subtle shadow coming across my nose. And we spent like, we were staring at it, zooming in, wondering what it came from. Where did this come from? We got up, we went to the scene. We were like, is it bouncing off of something? We looked at BTS <laughs> video, we're like, wait, was the kitchen light on? No, I turned that off. We, we had a bunch of different theories, but then we realized that this light, it was so subtle, and we realized that it was from that Fresnel coming across and spilling the slightest bit, hitting my hair and creating just a little shadow on my nose. So if there was another thing that I would change, it'd be a stinking barn, barn door. And a barn door would have caused or fixed all of our problems. It would have kept the light even more directional and keep that spill light coming down on me. Mm -hmm. So we saw that and now I cannot look at the scene the same because it just, it's staring at me. Well, it just, it goes to show that one, like how you were able to achieve such a soft light that even the faintest little hard light will show up. And two, it shows just your, and I think it's a good thing, but oh, I'm gonna use yeah. the word pickiness for lack of better uh -huh. words of how you want it to be perfect and how you have these standards that you've set for yourself. I only think those things are just super healthy for you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to my house and eating all my food and bugging me out and making that scene beautiful. Don't throw me under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, thank you so much. That was incredible. That scene was amazing. It was, <laughs> it was great. It was great having you. I'm sure there'll be many more times, but I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you learned something, maybe taking one or two things out of it um, from a brilliant mind as, he, as Brady has. Um, real quick, thank you so much to Charles for doing all the BTS. Follow Charles right here. He did an incredible job uh, shooting BTS for us. And uh, if you want to follow me and Brady, our socials are also right here. Uh, but make sure you tune into Brady's YouTube channel to see how he turned this nighttime scene into a daytime scene with the exact same compositions. It is incredible. Brady, my man. One thing I want to say, if you came here for my channel, unsubscribe to me and subscribe to Kevin to Make Room for that. He's somebody that I've looked up to for honestly a lot longer than I knew him as well. So please support him in this and leave me because <laughs> I don't want you there anymore. I don't mean that. It's just I want you with Kevin. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Team Kevin. Thanks for joining another episode of The Study of Light. I got to go to the bathroom and I'm hungry. Yeah. Let's go get some food Can or get something. Some food? Did you set up that crafty table yet? Okay, let's go get some crafty <laughs>